All right, for everything markets and maybe a little Tesla, we're going to check in with Thomas Hayes, founder, chairman, managing member of Great Hill Capital. Good to have you on here on a Friday. Um, let's start with how the week started, which is this the CPI, which led to the retail sales, which led to the PPI. None of it was what the markets wanted, but it does say the economy is strong. And you and I have talked about this before. So is this another case of good news as bad news? Well, the market is strong. The economy is strong, Phil. You saw the jobs report. I, I think the most important thing about the jobs report, which no one really covered, was we're all worried that Jay Powell has to go in and tighten the economy to the point where everyone gets laid off. What we saw in the jobs report was that the labor force participation rate went up to 62.4, which is a tie for the highest level since the pandemic started. So you can, you can create jobs, you can uh, lower wage inflation two different ways. Number one, you can destroy a lot of jobs, which was plan A, or people run out of savings. Guess what they do? They go back to work. And that's what we saw. And if we see that tick up closer to 63 percent labor force participation rate, we may get no landing, not a soft landing, not a hard landing. That additional supply of labor is going to keep wage inflation subdued and we're going to power through this thing. And maybe it's another hike, maybe it's two hikes, uh, but the economy can certainly bear it. And we're seeing it similar to what we saw in the late 90s, Phil, when you had the Fed funds rate above 6% and you had one of the greatest bull markets from 95 to 99. But, but we, we do have a problem, though, right? We have... We have new car prices that haven't come down. Used car prices have ticked up. We were talking in the break. Hotel prices are up significantly, okay, along the East Coast, specifically here in D.C. I'm not talking about 5%. I'm talking about 20, 30, 40% increases. Uh, on top of that, restaurants are still increasing their prices on the menu. We've only just begun on this inflation. And, and the thought that we've squashed it or killed it in any way, shape, or form, go check the rents in the area that you live in, specifically New York City. Rents haven't gone down. So if all these are components of inflation, that's the one thing we're trying to tackle and it's not working, what other tools does the Fed have? They can raise short-term rates all they want. That's not the issue. It's the long-term rates that need to be ratcheted up or you destroy the economy. Those are your two options. Well, I, I think that we're being a little hasty here. You've got the supply chain with the automobiles just now alleviating the, the chips have been coming in for the last four to six months. You are going to see a glut of new cars Used cars, they may tick up for a little bit. I am not bullish on used cars. I think those prices are going to continue to roll over. New cars are going to stabilize. Why? Because you're going to see a monstrous supply. They've had this managed scarcity. The U.S. OEMs have gotten away with murder for the last three or so years uh, under the guise of the supply chain shortage, et cetera, which was real. But now that those chips are flowing in, if they don't start producing cars, guess who's going to? You're going to have Kia. You're going to have Hyundai. You're going to have Toyota. They're going to flood the market at the low end where the U.S., uh, OEMs have not served, and you're going to see those new new car prices right. but, uh, but subside. You're the talking thing, about the supply side. On the demand side, it remains strong. People want to travel. People want to spend. Retail sales numbers are hot. You've got China coming out of the COVID thing. You've got Europe sort of getting back to normal again. And for the U.S., this is going to be our first year of mostly no talk of COVID, right? Because we still had COVID the beginning of last year. So this is our first full year. People want to go out and do stuff. And, and I don't know how you, you squash that demand because this is what the people want to do. So how can CPI or inflation get under control if, if, if that's the case? Well, the, the big one, the heaviest weighting that uh, everyone's talked about is the owner's equivalent rent. And that is not going to roll off uh, off of its base effects until May or June. And when it does, it is going to drop like a rock and you're going to see those numbers come down. And the market is smart. The market is seeing this. You know, we crashed in the NASDAQ 35 percent peak to trough last year. We crashed 25 percent in the S&P peak to trough last year. The market is a discounting mechanism. It, it accounted for the slowness that you're, you're going to see in terms of earnings have come down a bit, et cetera. And now people can't understand, why is the market up 18% off the October lows? And why does it keep pressing higher in the face of what is perceived to be bad news? Because if you look forward now, 2022 earnings are in the rearview mirror. We just finished those. You look at 2024, 
you've got $250 of S&P earnings, the forward multiple is only 16.5%, and that's what the market is now focused on. So the strength in the market, the weakness you saw right. last year right. was due to the earnings right. coming down this year. The strength you're seeing this year is because earnings are going up next year. Fair enough. I will do something I don't normally do, but I will say that you should have done pretty well since we last chatted because you were mostly bullish on the market. I know we had a little tick down here recently, but one of the things that you were looking at is obviously the Chinese markets, right? Let alone yeah. the U.S. markets, but you were bullish on stocks. And I think you yeah. still are. So where next to put our money, given that we're in kind of no man's land here? We're going to wait for the Fed. We're going to wait for the earnings, but you have a little bit of a, a gap here to wait. Yeah, well, here's, here's the deal. Everyone, when everyone's on one side of the boat, it usually doesn't turn out well. And what we saw this week in the fund manager survey is managers are still at record overweight bonds relative to stocks. They're waiting for a storm that may have already been passed. And what, the last time they were this overweight bonds was the pandemic lows and the great financial crisis lows. And you know better than anyone, that was the time to buy equities, not buy bonds. And, and so we like, even for the nervous Nellies, I've got two picks for you, even for the people who are still nervous to wade into the markets. And they're somewhat defensive, but the first one is a little bit of biotech exposure. We want to get exposure because we're seeing animal spirits come back into that group. Big, big Pharma has the cash. They don't have the growth. They're buying biotech companies. One of the companies we want to focus on is Amgen. It's trading at 12 and a half times forward in a market that's trading at 16 and a half times uh, next year's earnings. You get a three and a half percent dividend yield. All right, very, very quickly, the next one. Yeah. The best one is Amgen and Centene for today. We still love Alibaba. We still love Amgen. They're taking a breather after big moves off the lows. Stay with those. But if you want something right. a little defensive to wait, wait in, go with the health insurer Centene. Go with the biotech Amgen and uh, double digit growth at very low multiples. And you'll see some nice returns over the next year, year and a half. Thomas, you're one of our favorite segments. I know everybody's taking notes in the control room. Uh, have a good weekend, my friend. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. Next up.